Do you want me to introduce myself? Or? Um, yeah, let's do that. How do I look? Hair's good? Lipstick? Religion is not about brainwashing. It's not about rules. It's fundamentally about relationships. And the idea of a group of guys coming together to live in community, to support each other, was much, much, much more appealing than the idea of becoming a priest and kind of being on your own. This is not always easy. Yeah, it's, it's sometimes hard work and it's, it's sometimes difficult to concentrate. So sometimes I'm not able to do so. We're not all going to be friends. Um, there are some conflicts in the house or some guys who don't like each other. But we have a very strong tie to this house. And especially inside of a religious community because every character, every person shapes its nature. Every person has an effect on it. When I first came, there were no Americans living in the Stift. And it took me another 17 years to finally get to the point where I was willing to take the leap into Austria. And that's kind of where the story really begins. So whatever happens, whatever problems you discuss or difficulties you work through, you're working through in the context of a family. There was a certain amount of nervousness. Whether it be in Austria or in America, that the church is not just one culture, one group of people, one type of uh, life, but rather a mixture of a lot of different things. I don't know, they're just so, so brave. They come over here like thousands of miles and uh, start a new life in a country they don't know, in a house they don't know, in a community that's foreign to them and they don't know if it's going to work out. They don't know if um, it was just a wild dream or if it's really going to be it. Everybody has generally a bit of a crazy path to come to some random outpost in Vienna. I started to realize that, that something was really missing in my life. You know, maybe I should become a priest, I'm thinking about it, maybe that's the direction I'm going. I realized that, that for me my faith was, was something that was actually something that, that formed my decision making processes. I had what I like to jokingly call my first midlife crisis. Didn't go on with the graduates, didn't go on with the doctorate. That was something I was thinking about doing. But I decided I didn't really like politics and didn't really like what I was doing and I didn't really like anything about my life. And I went to Mass and there, uh, talked with the priest afterwards, said, Hi, I want to I become a Catholic. And he said, oh, oh, isn't that nice? Took my name down and was like, Yeah, I'm never going to hear from this kid again. When it came, it was time to get my life on track and I entered the Archdiocese of Washington as a seminarian studying for the priesthood. And then you get out of the seminary and you're probably alone or with one other priest in a parish somewhere. A diocesan priest, which is the kind of priesthood most people would think of when uh, thinking about a priest. Uh, that's most people's experience. Um, there are almost always or usually the typical scenarios that they would live in a parish more or less as some sort of a private contractor. And there might be a priest or two there who you may or may not get along with, but it's kind of isolated. Or a life of quasi-secular hermit. My future for Spokane, I was saying, I was, I was going to be alone for the rest of my life. And while I should have been able to figure that out, because I studied nine years before I became a priest for Spokane. We all want a place to fit in. I mean, that's the, one of the modern problems, or postmodern problems, or whatever you want to say. We all feel alone. We're isolated and alienated. We want to fit into something, because human beings are meant to be that way. 
Human beings are made to be in relationships with other beings. This living alone, I think, can produce problems. I mean, not only of the problems and scandals we have seen, but I would say of other problems, eating too much, drinking too much, uh, depressions. Elias said, well, funny you should mention that because there's a couple priests and I who are thinking about going to this monastery in Austria. And for exactly that reason, to be priests, to do parish work, to do priestly work, but to have a community, to have a family. Well, I first discovered um, the order, the Augustinian canons. I found them in history books. The life that they lived here uh, seemed to speak to what I would otherwise choose for myself. Uh, it just happened to, thank God, just kind of all fall into place that this place seemed to be the right place in my life at the right time. You want to share your life with other people. You want to hear what they have to say. You want to hear their stories. You want to tell their stories. You want to have somebody to hang out with, somebody to pray with, somebody to go to on a bad day, or somebody to come to you on a bad day, uh, somebody to go watch a movie with, somebody to go talk about um, you know, happy memories from the past, to go traveling with, to go do different things. It's simply um, uh, a normal, normal part of being human, as far as I'm concerned. Um, we seem to be at a happy crossroad between a contemplative monastic life and an active priestly one. The rhythm of this life is one of the most important things to me. I like the normal rhythm of life. I just like the routine about our life. I think it's wonderful. It's very pleasant. It's very relaxing. There are times for times to be together and times to be on our own. And one needs both. This is who I am. And this is me wanting to be this in this community. Of course, the term canon is not familiar to Americans. There are no canons in the States. When one would see this habit, one would have no idea, uh, first, what it is, because it's fairly um, interesting, and one doesn't see anything like this very often, if at all. So one usually asks or wonders, what am I? Am I even Catholic? If I am Catholic, what kind of Catholic are you? The image that people have in their head of a monastery, of a brown robe with a hood and a tunic. The reality is that there's many different ways of religious life in the Catholic Church, uh, and this is one that few people actually know of. And we in here in Kloster Neuburg, in our monastery, we call ourselves canons because we are uh, priests living together, um, and we have got the monastic rule of St. Augustine. Uh, so, therefore, we call ourselves Augustinian canons. The beauty of our life is quite simple, and that's the point, it's the simplicity. It's this, the two pillars of the, the common life are the common prayers and the common meals. Just like a family, really, that you have tough time together with the common meals, to be with each other, to, to talk to each other. I mean, food uh, is not just about um, nourishment for the body, it's nourishment for the soul and for the whole human being. Uh, and the great danger, of course, for, for society today, for families, for any um, human society, is that we don't spend time with each other. The food is an excuse to spend time with each other. It isn't the real purpose of the meal, it seems. I mean, yes, it's nice and it's good when the food is good and, and the, the wine is there and it's all very convivial. But that's the point, it's convivial. You're spending time with each other. You're ultimately feeding each other with the lives of one another because the point that we can all live together at all, whether it's because we're different um, human beings or different from different cultures, uh, different backgrounds, different languages, is because we're here because God brought us here. We're here because presumably we love God and we know we're loved by Him. Everybody pretty much here at the Stift jokes around with each other about who gives the tours because what exactly the history they're going to say. When you have a house that dates back to uh, the 1100s, you have quite a lot of history. And of course, history is somewhat fluid in exactly how it's recounted. And we don't actually have a codified 
single history book of the Stift. Different guys throughout the years have written accounts and we have a vast archives. But, um, so we like to joke, oh, okay, what's he gonna say now? You, you don't really know, you just kind of have to trust the living tradition, so to speak. So that's the joke, it's a way to kind of poke fun at each other a little bit in that regard. See, often throughout the Stift, and we'll see this later on, many examples of the founding of the Stift. The Stift, brief history of the founding, was Saint Leopold, uh, on his wedding day, his bride, uh, Margrave? Oh, I totally blank there. In the wedding between Leopold and Agnes, a strong wind blew up and blew her veil away. Both stood on the balcony during the wedding ceremony and the blast of wind blew away her precious veil. Was it a year, three years, I don't know, some time had elapsed. And then seven years later, Leopold was hunting. And the veil wasn't to be found for nine years. And his dogs barked up a tree. He suddenly saw uh, the veil in, the, uh, in an elderberry tree. And at this moment, St. Mary appeared to him and uh, asked him to build a church and to found a monastery on this very spot. I mean, it's, it's obviously a, a legion because uh, nine years later, it's not very likely that this uh, precious veil was still uh, in the same condition as it used to be. So throughout the Stift you'll see representations of Leopold finding the veil. Sometimes he's by himself. Sometimes he happens to be traveling with four bishops. Uh, sometimes he happens to be in a great retinue, like here, you know, you just, uh, the story always changes. Um, and we'll see that repeated as a theme throughout. Of course, the legend of finding Stift Klaus of Neuburg indicates that, oh, he was just going through the woods and there it was, and oh, this perfect place. Oh, wouldn't you know it, the place I'd like to build my new house and set up my new capital has a really awesome, um, strategic position for fighting and a really uh, large source of water, fresh water, there's a huge spring here. I didn't know it existed. Of course, that's a lie. He had to have known it existed. The Romans had a garrison here from the third century on. This is the creepy closet. Because we keep St. Leopold's head in here. This is the skull of St. Leopold. And this comes out for procession on St. Leopold, we, it's, all very, it's all very dramatic. And that's his forehead, so it's as if he's looking this way. It's his face. This is, of course, all nice jeweled thing, and uh, people used to kiss the forehead. So we take it out. It's, it's all very Baroque and trippy. This is the Verdun Altar. It's an incredible masterpiece. This, the crown, and the skull of Leopold are the three kind of big artifacts for the church. What we have here is scenes from both Old and New Testament foreshadowing the life of Christ. Daniel can give you a three-hour lecture on each and every one of the panels, and they are worthy of that because they really are quite amazing. My, my Bible study, we, uh, we were doing the Old Testament, but a couple of people said, well, we have the Verdun altar. Why don't we you know, come and look at it? And we did, I think, eight weeks here working on it, and we only got to about here. I'll just give you some of the brief highlights. Um, this is the first depiction of a Moor or a black person in Western art, we think. Uh, and hell is, I just love the hell. Can we always say that that's a cannon? Well, you put a cannon in there? Of course. Well, you, right, we, we got bishops, we've got, we've got bishops, we've got kings, we've got, oh, we're going to hell, of course. Just because you're religious doesn't mean you're going to heaven. But well, usually you don't put the people commission. <laughs> Listen, buddy, I'm giving the tour. You just shut the hell up. <laughs> All right. <laughs>
I think there are, there are two bigger things which, which are often misunderstood. The, the, the first thing is perhaps our, our richness, because people, people see the, the, the Abbey, there's, there's lots of gold, and they think that, that the canons, especially the canons of Kloster Neuburg, are very rich. Um, this is one, one, one thing mis misunderstood by people. The, the extravagance, the amount of money that people see when they come to a monastery like this can be shocking. Um, especially for Americans. I, I think for Americans, if one quickly takes a snapshot of Klosenover, it's massive. It's Baroque over the top. Look at the room that we're in. This is the Kaiser's dining room, for instance, okay? These are handcrafted Flemish uh, uh, tapestries that are priceless. We do not take a vow of poverty. And when one looks at the Stift, one has to say, well, it would be silly if we said we were taking a vow of poverty. The idea is that, like the Apostles, as one reads in the Acts of the Apostles, we hold all things in common. This is the Westminster Abbey of Austria. This is the royal monastery uh, personified. Um, this was supposed to be a vacation residence for the Kaiser of Austria. The Archducal Crown of Austria is in the next room. The Archducal Crown of the whole blessed country and, and the Stift I belong to is the custodian of this crown. And pause for dramatic squeak. This is the crown of the Archduke of Austria because the reality of this place is clearly this is a museum. We don't live here, we live on the other side. The, the trick here is to learn to be detached from what's around you, and accept it as simply, this is where I live. No, I don't live here because it's a palace, although I like it. I don't live here because it's in Austria, although I'm happy to be in Austria and work in, in, in the church in Austria. I live here because this is where our family lives, the Canon Drago St. Augustine. And that, so it's not really to me any of those things, it's just home. Well, of course, one of the big conflicts here before I arrived was exactly that of Americans. The U.S. boys, uh, in the beginning, they had problems. What are all these Americans doing here? What do they want from us? Should the Americans be in our house? Is this a house for Austria, an Austrian house? Maybe they saw them as a competition, you know? It's like guys their age. Not an easy experience for anybody, not for us, not for the house. Just getting used to something entirely new, having Americans here, first time in 900 years. There exists some tensions, which is quite natural, where people are coming together with all these different uh, backgrounds, with their different education with the different uh, upbringing. The really most difficult thing is naturally um, going from one kind of experience of the church in Virginia to coming here. Coming in close to Norberg is a little different. I'm in a foreign culture here. Uh, even after seven years, existing in a, in a foreign language in German uh, is, is difficult. I didn't speak any German when I came. 
and two months of, of, of German class doesn't get you very far. What I really miss from home, I'm sorry, is, is a parish, is the energy and the enthusiasm that Americans bring to a parish. Extremely different. Same church, but such a totally different history, different culture, different in so many ways, shockingly different. Uh, and that for years uh, has been a great burden as a consequence. We don't relate to each other the same way as I would to an American parish. There's no real uh, excitement for the faith here like you see back home, back in the States. I'd say I, fer I felt comfortable working here as a priest once I could speak German well enough to preach without having to read a homily. You know, that's when you can finally just talk to people. Unfortunately, uh, when you're saying Mass, people, they have that kind of blank stare. My German is whatever. <laughs> It works. I'm sure it's not beautiful, but that's part of the exotica of it, I suppose. People have to listen close to what I'm saying, not because it's um, uh, crazy or I think that the, the meaning gets across, but sometimes it's just expressed in ways that are a bit funny. But that's not necessarily bad, because then you have to listen. And they certainly aren't long and boring. I think they are, at least. Astonishingly enough, it was the oldest and the older guys who got used to it fastest. Um, yeah, maybe because of their war experience, where they already got to know a couple of Russian and American soldiers, and they were like, oh, these guys aren't all that bad. So what was, 10 years ago, a almost exclusively Austrian house is now something rather international. And it's probably something that the house is always continually trying to come to grips with. It took us a long time to convince people that we really were here to stay, that we really wanted to be a part of what this is. Relationships are not built overnight. A strong community is not built within a week, two months. It does take years, but from my perspective, I think it has all the ingredients in there to make something very, very strong. Oh, it's a microcosmos model of the church. You know, the church is supposed to be universal, so we can easily afford to have people from all the countries in our house. You know, if you're truly Catholic, it doesn't matter where you're from. You have to really live the community here to see, is this a community I want to join, I want to devote my life to? Well, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a big decision. You really have to invest in a big way when you come, and I think that's one of the great assets that foreigners bring to this house from wherever we come from. Um, living together with them uh, has opened uh, our view, uh, not only of America, but uh, the entire world. I think we love aha moments. I think Americans especially, or I'd say modern Western people, love these aha, bright moments. A part of the attraction was the idea that there was this energy in the house. Um, that there was just something going on, you knew something was heading in a particular direction. We've always had the dream of starting a house in America. Uh, I think it's a, a very exciting time in the Abbey because I can't remember, I mean, I don't, I'm not aware in the history of so much changing so quickly in such a positive direction. We've kind of exploded into this, this international um, reality. And so founding a new house somewhere is a natural consequence of that. Um, and we can bring this way of life, this way of priestly life, back to, back to America. The ladies. Everyone always asks about the ladies. And of course, everyone always thinks, suddenly in the back of their head, you don't like the ladies. That's why you're going into the priesthood. You don't much like the lady folk, do you? Well, yes, I love ladies. A complete stranger says, really? No sex? Yeah, well, I couldn't imagine that. So really, for the rest of your life, <laughs> you're never going to have sex? And I said, no. And he said, are you gay? What is hard about this? It's just not difficult. 
people do come and sometimes look at us walking around and think, who are the actors paid to dress up? I'm being interviewed at the moment. You can come watch if you like. <laughs> you can make faces and scream falsh whenever I say something you like. <laughs> We, we vote with balls, black balls and white balls. And if you get too many black balls, you're out. 